Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this morning here at the Portrait Gallery and via our live stream as we launch the 2021 Census data today. My name is Avril Templer, and I'm delighted to be your Master of Ceremonies this morning. I'll shortly be introducing our four excellent speakers, after which time I'll be opening up for a short period of question and answers, either from our live audience here or online. For those of us that are joining us via our live stream, you're able to ask questions at any time this morning by visiting the following address, www.polev.com forward slash 2021 census DRL. I'd like to also introduce our Auslan speakers here with us this morning, Mandy and Andrea. Thank you. Before we start the formal session, I have a couple of brief housekeeping items. Firstly, can I kindly remind you to please have your mobile phones either switched off or on silent? And secondly, in the unlikely event of an emergency, please follow all the directions provided to you from the gallery staff. It gives me great pleasure to now welcome Wally Bell to the stage, who will be offering us an official welcome to country. Wally is a Ngunnawal man and traditional custodian of the lands where we meet today. Can you please join me in welcoming Wally Bell? Yuma, hello. Uh, as was just said, I'm an honourable man. I've grown up here on country all my life. Um, my people, uh, we've occupied this region for something like 25,000 years, at least. Uh, that was just a scientific carbon dating they did for one of our rock shelter sites called Birigai. Um, we cover, our area covers something like 17,000 square kilometres. And as I do cultural heritage management, uh, I can say I've been privileged enough to see most of that country. Um, all Aboriginal people, Australia-wide, we get all our customs and belief systems from the land that we live on. Um, so you're going, you can see then that uh, cultural practice is going to be quite uh, diversified. Um, we all live by different forms of uh, bureaucracy, I suppose you'd call it. Um, but the major, ones that, major form of bureaucracy that we uh, abide by is what we call our traditional customary law. Now that law tells us as Aboriginal people what we must do while we're on country. One of those things that, uh, you know, like cultural practice is quite different, so is that traditional law. But one of the common themes that runs through, through that law is uh, that uh, as Aboriginal people, we must make visitors to our country welcome. Um, as I said, uh, cultural practice is quite different. So is that way we do welcome to country. It's gonna be done quite different wherever you are in, in, in Australia um, by the um, local traditional custodians. Um, <coughs> non war people have different clan groups. We have uh, you know, seven different clan groups. My clan group are the Yar people. Uh, we come from that place they now call Yas. So the way we do uh, welcome to country is that we not only welcome people onto our country, but we look after and care for you while you're here. Now that's done in two ways. We um, look after you in a physical sense and we look after you in a spiritual sense. The physical part's gonna be taken care of by what we call our spirit of the land, which means as you're walking around on country, the, the land will look after you to make sure that nothing really physical happens to you in a bad way. The other part of that is that <laughs> We have um, bad spirit out our country as well. Now that's something you can't see or touch, but we know it's there because people get affected by it. The land that you're on gets affected by it. So we call upon our past generations, our ancestral spirits then to remove bad spirit from country. The way that uh, we get those spirits to join us in uh, welcoming you on the country and looking after you while you're here is, I, I make a little bit of noise and then I call for those spirits to join me and welcome you on the country and looking after you. I play uh, clap sticks to make the noise. And during that process, um, I'll be calling for them to come and join us. Here we go.
Okay, my, my being an honourable man, and uh, I have really strong ties with my country. I can tell that those spirits have now joined us. Um, as I said then, the uh, spirit of the land will now look after you as you're walking around on country. At this very moment, our ancestral spirits are going around to everybody here looking at your auras, making sure there's no bad spirit that might be attached to it. If they do find that stuff, they just grab hold of it, toss it off country, get rid of it. We don't want it here because we don't want it to affect you as a person. We certainly don't want it to affect the land that you're on. The spirits ask that you do two things while you're on country. First one, really important one, respect this place that you're in. Look after it, care for it, as we have done for thousands of years. Second thing I want you to do is also to respect and be kind and courteous to other people that you meet while you're on country. So if you do these two things for us, the spirits will then harmonise with your stay on Nunawal country. So may the spirits be with you today, tomorrow and for always. I'll finish with some words and language. Dalawa nunna, dalawa dunawal, yangu nilawari, dunamayan, naraganawali. Yomalundi. This land is not all land. We've all come together today for this grand occasion. Welcome. John Yamaba, thank you. Thank you, Wally Bell, traditional custodian of the lands where we meet today for your generous invitation to share your traditional lands and waters with us. On behalf of the Australian Bureau of Statistics, can I also pay my respects to the traditional custodians of these lands, the Ngunnawal people? Can I extend that respect to all and any traditional custodians joining us here in the theatre or online? I acknowledge and pay respect to all elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all First Nations people here and via the live stream. It's with great pleasure that I now introduce the Honourable Dr. Andrew Lee, the Assistant Minister for Competition, Charities and Treasury, who will be delivering his opening remarks as we launch the 2021 Census data today. Can you please join me in welcoming the Honourable Dr. Andrew Lee? Well, thanks very much. And can I too acknowledge the Ngunnawal people in whose lands we're gathered today and pay my respects to elders past and present and uh, uh, thank Wally Bell for a really powerful uh, welcome to country today. Uh, look, it's a real honour to be here to officially launch the 2021 Census of Population and Housing uh, as the Assistant Minister with responsibility for the Australian Bureau of Statistics. I do so with great respect for the ABS and for the Census and for the way in which uh, the work of David Gruen and your team uh, helps to inform policy in Australia. Uh, before I joined politics, I was a professor at the Australian National University and a keen user of census data. Uh, I've used the cross tabulations, the microdata, the community profiles. Uh, I've used census data to investigate everything from long run trends in income inequality to whether there's a relationship between child gender and parental divorce. Economists, researchers and stats nerds like me love the census. It's a snapshot of Australia and gives Australians a detailed picture of their communities. I spent part of my childhood in Malaysia and Indonesia and I'm a passionate advocate for better understanding a multicultural and inclusive society. Census data helps us better understand emerging communities, informing how and where governments can engage. And the significance of the 2021 census must be acknowledged as we mark the 50th anniversary of the 1971 census, which was the first census to include Indigenous people in the census results in full for the first time. In the words of Gough Whitlam, Australia's treatment of her indig Aboriginal people will be the thing which the world will judge Australia and Australians, not just now, but in the greater perspective of history. The 50th anniversary of the 1971 census, which was the first census after that 1967 referendum, is an important milestone in the history of Australia. 
Another historic achievement for the nation and for the Australian Bureau of Statistics has been the successful delivery of the census during the pandemic. The ABS successfully navigated through COVID-19 restrictions to conduct a safe and a secure census. This was an impressive feat during a challenging and evolving operation, operating environment. I commend them for this. I also commend the many millions of Australians who took the time to diligently and carefully fill in those census forms while under COVID lockdown. I'm pleased to note that Dr Gruen and the ABS have engaged an independent advisory panel to review census data and provide a report on its quality. The ABS's tagline for the 2021 census is every stat tells a story. And historically, the Australian census has led to remarkable discoveries, surprises and stories about our nation. The results of the 1911, 1921 and 1933 census found a curious pattern in the data of deaf mutism, as it was known then, in a specific age cohort of young people. Research and analysis by ophthalmologist Norman McAllister Gregg and statistician Oliver Lancaster led to the discovery of the link between rubella and congenital problems in unborn children. On a different note, I also learned that the 1947 census was the only Australian census to ever ask if a dwelling had access to a flushing toilet. 52% <laughs> of Australians said yes, uh, and it turned out that 3% of those dwellings had a toilet which was shared with another dwelling. A useful reminder as to how times have changed. In more recent times, we've seen the 2016 census show how multicultural Australia had become. In that census, half the population were a first or a second generation migrant. As every stat tells a story, every census must tell a multitude of stories. What will be the big stories from the 2021 census? We're about to find out. So it's a true honour to launch the 2021 census data today alongside so many capable and talented people from the Australian Bureau of Statistics and the broader Australian Public Service. Thank you to those who've worked hard to deliver the 2021 census. I look forward to learning the results alongside you today. Thanks very much. Thank you, Minister Lee, the Assistant Minister for Charities, Competition and Treasury, for sharing your story about the value of the census in Australia. The ABS goes to great lengths to ensure the quality of our statistics and to assure the public that our data can be used with confidence. We're fortunate to have a member of the Statistical Independent Assurance Panel with us here today to share the panel's assessment <coughs> excuse me, about the quality of the 2021 census data. Please join me in welcoming the chairperson for the Independent Assurance Panel, Emeritus Professor Sandra Harding. Thank you, Avril. I also would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we um, meet today, the Ngunnawal people. And thank you, Mr Bell, for your very moving uh, welcome uh, to this country. It was much appreciated. We certainly acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. First, I'll provide a few preliminary comments and then let you know the outcome of the Independent Assurance Panel's work. The Australian statistician established the 2021 Census Statistical Independent Assurance Panel to review the quality of the 2021 census data in recognition of the importance of transparency in data quality and the importance of the census data overall, noting that the census on this occasion was undertaken during the COVID-19 pandemic. The specifics of the tasks set for the panel are contained in the panel's terms of reference and they're located at Appendix D in our report. The panel members come with a wide range of experience and expertise. The panel members are Ms. Leanne Little, Director of the Aboriginal Justice Unit, Northern Territory Government Department of the Attorney General and Justice, Professor Peter MacDonald, AM, Emeritus Professor, School of Demography, the Australian National University, Mr. Peter Morrison, former Chief Assistant Chief Statistician of Canada, who is responsible for the Canadian Census. 
Mr. Dennis Truen, AO, former Australian statistician from 2000 to 2007. Mr. Stephen Walters, the Chief Economist of the New South Wales Treasury and member of the Australian Statistics Advisory Council and myself, Emeritus Professor of James Cook University and former Chair of the Australian Statistics Advisory Council from 2001 to 2006. I want to assure you that the panel worked as a body independent of the Australian statistician to discharge our terms of reference, meeting on nine occasions in person by video conference and by teleconference. A great deal of our work was undertaken between meetings with discussions occurring via email and through a secure site provided for the purpose by the ABS. The timing of the panel's work has meant that our analyses have been undertaken and conclusions drawn about the quality of the 2021 census data at the national, state and territory level, but not for data at a more detailed level. And now I'm pleased to let you know the outcome of our work. The panel finds that the 2021 census data is fit for purpose, it is useful and usable, and of comparable quality to previous censuses and to international benchmarks. The 2021 census can be used with confidence. The panel undertook a range of analyses in making our assessment. The response rate is a very important contributor to data quality. The panel considers that the high response rate for private dwellings sitting at 96.1% against a target of 95% was an outstanding achievement given the challenges provided by the pandemic. This response rate is comparable to response rates seen in other countries such as Canada and the United Kingdom which undertook censuses during the pandemic and higher than that of New Zealand where the census was conducted pre-pandemic. The panel also considered the results of the post enumeration survey, a survey of 50,000 households undertaken independently of and immediately following the census. That survey provides an important quality check on the 2021 census data. Comparison of the results of the post enumeration survey with the 2021 census data shows an observed outcome that is broadly consistent with the 2016 and 2011 censuses. In all cases, the post-enumeration survey has pointed to a net undercount of persons on census forms. However, the 2021 result is an improvement on recent censuses with a lower net undercount than those observed for 2016 and 2011. Another very important check on quality involves comparing the census results with the estimated resident population, which is Australia's official population estimate. The estimated resident population is rebased every five years using the census and then adjusted quarterly between censuses, taking account of births, deaths and migration. The expectation is that the new census data should be broadly in line with the 2021 unrebased estimated resident population. The panel found that 2021 census data align well with expectations and that these data can be used to rebase the estimated resident population, which is one of the most important uses of the census. The panel also examined a number of key topics in the census, including population counts, sex, age, income, counts of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, country of birth, language and ancestry. The panel found that the levels and distribution of characteristics matched expectations well and were comparable to other data sources where applicable. However, the panel also found that despite increased efforts and investment by the ABS, an estimated 17% net undercount of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples has persisted in 2021, consistent with the last two censuses. The ABS will examine this further. The panel also made some other observations on matters of interest, and these are contained in our report but today, I want to comment on the ABS's management of the 2021 census during the COVID-19 pandemic. That census was undertaken at a time when many parts of Australia were in lockdown and movements into and out of Australia were tightly controlled. Over the period of the census, approximately a half of Australia's population were in lockdown at some time. Like many work organisations around the country, the ABS operations were affected by the pandemic, including difficulties with recruitment and the movement of field officers around the country. Nevertheless, through planning, risk management and rigorous testing, 
disruptions, disruptions to census field operations due to the pandemic were largely overcome without impact on the quality of census data or the safety of the public and census staff. The panel considers the ABS's approach to conducting the 2021 census during the pandemic was both impressive and well regarded and well managed. The ABS's census planning and innovation meant that the 2021 census fared very well despite the pandemic. So to conclude where I began, based on our analyses, the panel has determined that the quality of 2021 census data is broadly in line with expectations and of comparable quality to the 2016 and 2011 census data and to international benchmarks. Therefore, the Statistical Independent Assurance Panel charged with examining the quality of the 2021 census data has concluded that the 2021 census is fit for purpose, it is useful and usable, and it will support the same variety of uses as was the case for previous censuses. Thank you. Thank you, Emeritus Professor Sandra Harding, for sharing the panel's findings with us this morning. I would now like to introduce the Australian statistician, Dr. David Gruen, who will be followed by Ms. Teresa Dickinson, the Deputy Statistician and Senior Responsible Officer for the 2021 Census. David and then Teresa will both be providing us with an overview of some of the stories that have come out of the 2021 Census data launching today. Please join me in firstly welcoming Dr. David Gruen. Let me begin by thanking Wally Bell for his warm welcome to country uh, and acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land we're meeting on, the Ngunnawal people. Uh, I acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and contribution to the life of this city and region and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge and welcome other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be attending today or viewing online. Thank you to Minister Lee for your opening remarks and for setting the scene for today's launch. I'd also like to thank Sandra Harding and all the members of the Independent Assurance Panel for their review of the quality of the census. A special welcome too to Dennis Truen and David Kalish, former Australian statisticians. David was in charge of preparations for the census um, until December uh, 2019. Welcome. As I think you may have heard from others, today is like Christmas for data nerds across Australia. We are releasing millions of data today, millions of pieces of data today that tell the story of our beautiful, large and diverse country. The first stat from the 2021 census I would like to share is that 16,242 people reported in the census that they use Auslan at home. I'm pleased to welcome our Auslan interpreters today to help share our census insights. As Professor Harding said, the 2021 census data is of high quality. Over 96% of Australian dwellings completed the census, despite around half of households being in lockdown at stages during the collection period. This is an increase from 2016 and above our target. The net undercount of the census, that is the proportion of people who should have been counted but were missed, is the lowest on record at 0.7%. We aim to make the online service secure, easy and convenient, and we're pleased to say that four out of five households completed the census in this way. For the first time, the census counted over 25 million people. This is an increase of 8.6% since 2016. Australia has more than doubled its population in the past 50 years. Despite the impacts of COVID-19 in slowing migration, the increase since 2016 is only slightly less than the 8.8% increase seen in the five years to 2016. The ACT continues to be the fastest growing state or territory with growth of over 14%. 
The ACT has been the fastest growing for two censuses in a row and its population has increased by 50% since 2001. 80% of the Australian population lives in the eastern states of Australia. The 2021 census provides a unique snapshot of Australia and the impacts of COVID-19. The 2021 census counted 2 million more people at home on census night than in 2016, with half a million fewer of us travelling overseas and also fewer people away from home within Australia. In terms of people moving in the other direction, that is into Australia, th these were just over 60,000 international visitors during the census, far less than the 300,000 we counted uh, visiting in 2016. Areas like the Gold Coast saw the impact of international travel restrictions with a significant drop in people at hotels and motels. In this census, the 50th anniversary of the first census to include all Australians, over 800,000 people identified as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. This continues the significant increases we have seen each census with an increase uh, of over 25 per cent since 2016. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are, are, are now 3.2 per cent of the Australian population, with ne nearly two thirds living in either New South Wales or Queensland. This is the first time the census has included a question on long-term health conditions, and this will be a key resource for delivering health services in Australia. Almost one third of Australia's population reported having at least one of the 10 listed long-term health conditions. As might be expected, the most common health conditions reported change with age. The most reported health condition for children was asthma, whereas for younger adults, it was mental health conditions and for the older population, arthritis. The other new question was about current and previous service in the Australian Defence Force. Australia has nearly 600,000 current or former service members. This census has given us a snapshot of the population who have previously served, which is half a million Australians. Our largest age group of those who have previously served are in their 70s, and this will include many who served in Vietnam. The data collected in this census will enable delivery of more targeted services for Australian veterans. To continue telling the stories from the 2021 census, I would like to introduce Teresa Dickinson. Teresa is the Senior Responsible Officer for the 2021 Census and Deputy Australian Statistician, Deputy uh, Statistician at the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Teresa. Thank you, David, and good morning, everyone. It's my great pleasure to share some more of the stories from the 2021 Census. The Census provides insights into many ways that we are evolving as a nation, and I'll briefly look at some aspects of generational change, cultural diversity, religion, and housing. Australia is undergoing a generational shift. While Australia is an ageing country, the 2021 Census has seen the number of millennials those born from 1981 to 1996, catch up to the baby boomers. The baby boomers and millennials each have over 5.4 million people. However, the number of millennials is increasing through migration, while the number of baby boomers is beginning to decrease. The census highlights a variety of differences between baby boomers and millennials, including their propensity to volunteer, religious affiliation, and needs for assistance with tasks of daily living. And I'll leave the more analytical amongst you to unveil some of these deeper insights using the vast amount of data that we now have available for you. While the pandemic has impacted the flow of people into Australia, the census shows that there were still over 1 million migrants arriving in Australia since 2017. And in fact, 850,000 of those arrived before the end of 2019. The number of us who are first generation Australians, those born overseas, and second generation Australians, those with one or, one or both parents born overseas, which includes me, has grown and is now over half the Australian population. From census data, we can see emerging communities. For example, our population from Nepal has more than doubled since the last census. 
And this change can be seen with Nepali being one of the top five languages now in Canberra and Tasmania. We have seen the largest increase in country of birth outside Australia being India, with 220,000 additional people counted, making India now the second highest overseas born population after England and leapfrogging China and New Zealand. Turning to religion, the, the question on religion always attracts significant interest. In 2021, the number of people reporting no religious affiliation continued to grow and is now really nearly 40% of responses. This is an increase of eight percentage points since 2016, which is also an increase of eight percentage points on 2021. Christianity is still the highest reported religion in Australia, with over 40% of responses to this question nominating as Christians or providing a Christian denomination as their answer. However, this has decreased by eight percentage points since 2016. Nearly half of those who reported a, religious, a Christian religious affiliation reported that they were Catholic. The census has seen a growth of over 50% of people reporting that they're Hindus in line with migration from India. 2.7% of the population, in fact, are Hindus, and Islam is our second largest religion at 3.2% of the population. Now, turning to the types of dwellings we live in. The 2021 census showed that just over a third of the dwellings occupied on census night were owned with a mortgage, just under a third were rented, and just under a third were owned outright. The Northern Territory had the highest percentage of renters in Australia, with renters making up 46% of the housing market there. The number of homes owned either outright or with a mortgage has not changed significantly since 1996. However, the, sh the share of homes which are owned with a mortgage rather than outright has been growing. Over the last 25 years, the number of homes owned outright has increased by 10%, while the number owned with a mortgage has doubled. Now that Dr. Gruen and I have whetted your appetites for the riches available from the 2021 census data, I recommend that you head to the ABS website and start exploring for yourselves. We've made it very easy to get to the data. You can search for a specific geography, such as a suburb, postcode, local government area or state, and get data for that area. And we have over 10 million tables of data available for you. And it'll take a while until you get through all of those, I'm sure. <laughs> we also have census topic pages that provide an overview of each census topic with downloadable data. And in addition to that, our team are available to support you in searching the data or extracting more detailed findings for you. Before I conclude, as head of the census for the ABS, I'd like to offer a couple of acknowledgements. I'd like to extend my thanks to all the staff who worked on the census. With over 30,000 people involved, some starting six years ago in 2016, it's been a massive effort. The ABS cannot conduct the census without the support of other organisations, both across government, such as Services Australia, the Australian Cyber Security Centre and the Digital Transformation Agency, nor without input and help from a wide range of suppliers from the private sector. And we thank you, we offer thanks to all our partner organisations. Most importantly, I pass on the ABS and my personal thanks to all Australians for completing the census last year. As Dr. Gruen highlighted, the census has some unusual challenges due to the pandemic. However, Australians still responded, ensuring that the 2021 census was successful and that it now provides very valuable data for the nation. By answering the 65 questions on the census form, you told the story of your families, your community and your generation. Thank you, Australia. Finally, to everyone here, thank you for joining us today to launch the 2021 census, and we look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. David Gruen and Ms. Teresa Dickinson for sharing some of the wonderful stories that have come out of the 2021 census data today. <coughs> Excuse me. This concludes the speaker component of our event this morning. So we'll now be opening up for a brief period of Q&A, and this will be an opportunity for anyone with more general questions about the nature of the census for our panelists, David and Teresa, this morning. We're also fortunate enough to have quite a few data experts in the theatre today. So for those of you with more specific, detailed data questions, there'll be an opportunity to ask those one-on-one -on -one after the open Q&A session. And we'd obviously like to answer as many questions as we can in the next 20 minutes or so. Um, so if you could please, in the interest of everyone having an opportunity to ask a question, please try and limit yourself to a single question if you can. 
For those of us watching via the live stream, just a reminder, you can ask your questions via our Poll EV website on screen right now. And we have a couple of roving microphones in the theatre here this morning. So I may ask you to please raise your hand if you have a question, um, but please wait until the microphone is with you before you start asking your question. And take a moment to please introduce yourself to the panelists before you ask your question. We're going to start by taking questions here in the floor and the, at the theatre, and then I'll jump to any questions that have come in online. Open to the floor for any questions. Thank you. Rachel Klein from the Age. I'm just wondering, given the census was conducted during the pandemic, what sort of interesting piece of data were thrown up uh, because of that pandemic? Well, we saw that we counted over 2 million more people staying at home on census night than in 2016, uh, and a million fewer of, us, fewer of us travelling overseas. So that's a very basic figure about where we were on census night. And we can also see um, a response to restrictions on travel with overseas visitors counted only 61,000 as opposed to 315,000 in the previous census. There will be a lot more interesting information, detailed information on the effects of COVID in our second release in, in October when we've got information about employment and uh, internal migration, how people have moved between censuses. So we're all looking forward to that, but we're, we're starting to see a lot of um, interesting information about the changes that we saw during COVID. I was just going to add to that and just say one of the things that will be interesting once people get a chance to delve into the data is comparing what uh, various aspects of people's lives in those parts of the country that were locked down with other parts of the country that weren't. So that will be an interesting comparison. So roughly half the country was locked down and there are going to be all sorts of things where, pe where people's lives have been imposed upon because of that and comparing that with, um, with how people were living in those parts of the country that where they weren't locked down, that will be an interesting comparison that, that people will be able to um, delve into when, the, when they get a chance to look at the data in detail. Uh, it's Marcus Mannheim from the ABC. And you might have just muted my question um, because it might relate to the second release. But I wanted to know at this early stage, I think the question a lot of people are asking about the pandemic is did it change fundamental ways in which we live? Like, did we leave the cities? Did working from home change our approach to, in particular, where we live? Is it too early to get an indication of the answer to that question. From the census data, we haven't got that detailed sort of information yet. October is sort of, you know, if this is Christmas Day, then October is maybe your birthday or some <laughs> other major celebration. Um, but there's certainly been a lot of commentary, hasn't there, from various demographers and social, social commentators about what we saw happening. So there's a lot of theories out there about where we moved to, how much work did we do, what did a journey to work look like, was it more than just going into your lounge room? And mm. that's the type of information that we'll have available in a couple of months that people can really dig into. Hi, um, Amelia Dunn from SBS. Uh, obviously engaging linguistically diverse Australians is always something that the focus, that census focuses on. Um, but how much more difficult was that in the pandemic? I think I spoke to you, Teresa, a couple of weeks from the census about this. And do you think it was a success being able to get into community make sure they understand, make sure they know where to access it, despite the fact that half of the country was into lockdown. Have you been able to see those results? So, thank you, Amelia. I think when we spoke, I talked about some of the arrangements that we were putting in place to support culturally and ling linguistically diverse communities um, be part of the census. So we had to do a fair bit of pivoting from some face-to-face -face arrangements Back, it's come back? Yep. Okay. So we pivoted from face-to-face uh, -face work uh, in some areas to uh, virtual. So we had a lot of virtual online sessions helping people fill in the forms um, and we they, they proved very popular and that's something that I think we're going to do next time as well potentially. So when we looked at the data coming in, even live while we were during, 
during enumeration, we could see uh, relative numbers, relative proportions compared to what we were expecting for various areas that we knew were heavily culturally and linguistically diverse. And we were delighted that we were getting really strong response across the board there. Um, there were no particular pockets that we were identifying where we thought people had really missed out, hadn't got the message about doing the census, hadn't completed the census. So that, that was really pleasing for us that, that everybody had responded. And from the Canberra Times, look, I just wanted to ask with regards to kind of the mortgage and the housing makeup in Australia, was there any between I where think I have a backup. migration to parts of the country and more housing being committed to with mortgages? I've been given, but we do have experts available after the meeting who can, who can talk you through that. Unless, David, you're full no, bottle I, on that. I don't have that level of yeah. detail, but we, yeah. I, mean, I mean, obviously the huge benefit of the census is you get all this information and then you have the opportunity for researchers to pore over it and, and, and find out those sort of levels of detail. There's quite a lot of interesting, quite a lot of interesting patterns in the housing data. Um, in terms of home ownership and the proportion of people who are who own who own their home but have a mortgage, that's gone up quite a lot. Um, whereas the proportion of people who own their house home outright has gone down by a reasonable amount. So there are quite a lot of patterns in terms of home ownership in the data, um, but um, it'll take some time to 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 elucidate that in in detail. Sure. So, the it's worth understanding the it's worth understanding the history. Um, the the parliament and the government determine the topics for the census, and uh, for the 2021 census, um, the ABS was uh, was um, instructed to ask a question on sex, but not on gender and not on sexual orientation. So the question that, that was asked was about a person's sex and the options were male, female and, uh, and um, non-binary sex. So the, the, um, there will be an opportunity to revisit that uh, for the 2026 census and we will be, the uh, ABS will be engaging in a public consultation process starting later this year um, to uh, ask the community if there are, uh, if there are other questions that, that people think that we should be asking. So, the, so there's no question that the, the 2021 census did not collect information on gender identity, um, and so it, 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 it can't be used to infer information on gender identity. Um, and the, uh, the, the, we, we, we are going to go to some, diff, some trouble to carefully analyse the results of the sex question and put out an analytical article in a couple of months to, uh, which will go into detail about how those answers were. Um, so people not only answered the question, but also uh, had an opportunity to write um, to write comments. And we will be providing detail on that in a in a detailed um, uh, in a detailed article. Um, so the answer to your question is: the census did not collect information on 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 um, on gender identity, and therefore it does not collect. It it can't give you. Uh, 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 an estimate of the pro of the trans population. trust in government in Australia and whether it's reflected here at all. And I wonder what the next innovation in the census is given that online participation is uh, already settled. 
So I think it, it, um, uh, trust in government is a work in progress. Uh, I think um, the uh, as a consequence of the pandemic and and and. and uh, um, there were many of the many of the measures of trust in government um, ticked up, um, uh, and so I think people responded to um, the, uh, the all the initiatives by um, feeling kind of more positive about government. So that's uh, from from where I sit. That's a that's a good thing. Um, in terms of the security of the. Census. I've often uh, commented that it's an arms race, in, by which I mean that uh, we're we're trying to obviously doing our utmost to protect census data and have done that successfully, but um, the bad the bad actors are continuing to get more sophisticated and um, the defences have to get more sophisticated. So it's not. It's a moving feast, unfortunately, and it requires continued vigilance to make sure that you maintain uh, levels of, of uh, security that, uh, that are fit for purpose. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the innovations this time, which was extraordinarily important, was having the Australian Cyber Security Centre um, uh, partner with us from the get-go and to, uh, so, that, so that we had the best possible advice about uh, high quality um, cyber security protection. But as I say, this is something where um, it's where things don't stand still and where you have to keep um, have to keep improving the the defences that to ensure that that uh, nothing untoward happens. And the other thing I would say to people is uh, we do the very best we can, but but you can't be 100% certain at any time that, the, that you're going to, that everything is going to go according to plan. But it went, it went extremely smoothly because of an, an, an enormous amount of work put into make sure that, uh, that, the, that, the prep, that everything possible was done. Uh, and then on the, on the, on the response rate, uh, we got a res we got an online response rate of just under eighty percent, but we think that um, that can continue to rise. It saves the community money um, because uh, it's it's cheaper to um, to uh, collate an online response than a paper response. But we will continue to provide the possibility of paper responses for those people f f who who are uncomfortable about doing it online. The, the, we've seen a similar pattern uh, in the previous two censuses, and namely increases of that sort of order of magnitude in the number of uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are self-identifying. Um, so um, the numbers went up for, so 2.8% of the Australian population uh, identified as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in 2016, and that's up to 3.2% now. So. Um, uh, I think um, so. It's not. It's not. Um, it's not just natural increase. It's also an increase in the number of people who are self-identifying. And in fact, the assurance panel looked into this and um, looked at the at the age distribution of. Um, there are charts in the in the report that's just become public that um, the assurance panel has put out. We, so you can look at the age distribution of people who identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, and one of the one of the things which uh, I think is a is a very encouraging is that the proportion of people who are over 65 who are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders has gone up by by roughly 50 percent. So there's a big increase in older people who who are identifying as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, and I think it'll 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 um, repay a lot of research to actually think, find out about why it is that more people are feeling comfortable about identifying as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. Thank you. We might jump to a few questions that have come in um, online. 
Um, the first question is, why did the 2021 census add two new questions? Well, ultimately, it's part of our democratic process uh, and with the, 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 um, the parliament uh, um, and, the, the, and the government uh, requested that two new topics were, um, were um, added. Um, real estate on the census form is valuable because we are asking the whole country to fill in these forms. So there is a limit to the number of questions that people are going to be happy to answer. And Australia has quite a long census form by, by international standards. So we're up to 65 questions. And although there are lots of things that are well worth asking about, uh, it's, you do have to make a judge, you do have to come to a judgment about what uh, this, what, what this valuable, what you're going to use this valuable real estate for. But both the um, uh, defence force um, service, service in the defence forces and long-term health conditions are both topics that um, that we thought and the government thought were well worth asking about in the census. Uh, we have another question that's come in online. Um, were there any particular unusual or unexpected stats from your perspective? Oh. <laughs> um, look, I, I, was, I thought it was unusual that there's now half a million of us living in high-rise flats, higher than nine storeys. That wasn't something I expected to see. And while I knew that we are a nation of drivers, the very, very high proportion of, of households that have at least one motor vehicle, that was a surprise to me too. And the fact that the number of Jedi have gone down, that was a surprise too. <laughs> and the number of Pastafarians has gone down. Yep. Uh, another question from online. We've heard about the growth of the millennial population. What other generational shifts has the 2021 census highlighted? So for us, the, the main story was the millennials and baby boomers, and that might be part of the demographics in the office too, that that story particularly appealed to. I, I think what's going to be really interesting is looking at the differences between the generations in terms of things like home ownership, in terms of things like religious affiliation, in terms of working patterns, especially during COVID. So it's not so much you know, just comparing one generation with another, but looking at how um, behaviours and expectations are changing across the generations. Uh, another question, um, who is the average Australian? Ah, uh, yes, we the do. average Australian, <laughs> okay. yeah, we do I, I, can, I can read this, effect. Yes. Um, a female aged 30 to 39 years living in a couple family with children in the greater capital city area with an average weekly family income of 3,000 or more. That is our average Australian. questions back in the theatre. Maybe right before we wrap up, I might invite our panellists to share their most interesting uh, reflection on the 2021 census, something that's uh, your favourite statistic from the 2021 census. Well, my, my favourite statistic, I think, in the sense is that we now have good quality data on those who've served with the Australian Defence Force. That's something Australia hasn't had available up until now. And of course, we have that at small area level, which means that we can provide service and do planning for veterans. The, the, the take home number for me was that one in every five households in Australia has one or more veterans. I just had no idea it would be that large. And it really brings home the additional need for support for that, that community. I guess um, being a stats nerd, I'm interested, I quite get quite excited about age distribution of the population. Um, and um, so the, the fact that the millennials are, um, uh, well, on census night, the millennials are within a whisker of um, the number of baby boomers. And as was pointed out to me this morning by one of the, um, one of the ABS people, by now it's almost certain that the, that the uh, millennials have overtaken the baby boomers because <laughs> they were only 5,000 short last, last, um, last August. So the changing age distribution is, is of interest um, and um, that has profound implications for the sorts of society we are uh, and, and the sort of things that, um, that, that are particular, become particularly prominent. 
Thank you. Great reflections. I think that concludes our um, formal event this morning. I would like to take a moment to please thank our speakers and panellists this morning for sharing their time and insights with us. Thank you.